All right, Sisters Fan Season 7, Episode 1, entitled New Beginnings. And based on the reactions on Twitter during my live stream, the comments on a bunch of my posts and my DMs, it was a divisive episode to say the least. But if you follow me on my social media platforms, matter of fact, if you if you aren't doing that, why aren't you? There are links in all of my videos, description box below, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook groups, what have you, it's there. I actually enjoy the episode. Was it perfect? Not quite. But at the same time, I'm feeling the new vibe. I know it's going to take some getting used to. Some people said, "I, you know what, I check back into the show to see what the new writers are cooking and I'm not feeling it. And that's understandable, but I think to be fair, you need to give the show a few episodes in to really get a feel for what the new writers are trying to do. Because as I mentioned on uh, Twitter last night, I'm not looking for perfection. I mean, it's like a presidential candidate who won the election. They get in the White House and they got to cl clean up the mess that the previous president left behind. It's not something that's going to be done in, you know, one, one day or one term. Or in this case, 42 minutes. This episode was a three month time jump. So it had to do a lot of things. Pick up some of the things that were in season six and previous seasons. Explain why certain elements are no longer in the show, such as Calvin or Brian. But at the same time, give us a look into what the sisters lives are at the moment three months later. So this episode was a bit messy and I can see why people would, would feel some sort of way about it. But I think it accomplished what it was meant to do. So maybe starting next week in episode two and beyond, the pacing might kind of slow down just a tad because we don't need to over uh, over explain everything. Oh, we know this is what Andy's doing. We know this is what Karen is doing. We know this is what this character's up to. So, you know what? Even though I didn't watch the full series, I watched like five episodes, Fuller House, the Full House reboot on Netflix, if you watch the first episode of that reboot, you could tell that they were really piling on the nostalgia by trying to cram in as many Easter eggs and nods to the original Full House series within the first episode. That's what this felt like. Basically, cramming in as much Sisters lore into one episode to explain why things are the way they are. So I think episode two should definitely be a bit less congested. So what's my score? 8.5 out of 10. I liked it. I didn't want to give it a 10. I don't think it deserved a 10, but I do feel like this did a decent job of getting us to where we need to be for the new beginnings. Now, my least favorite character was definitely Gary. They literally ramped up this dude's creepy factor. Uh, as fans said last night, um, he's no longer scary Gary. He's nasty Gary. And I said, okay, you know what? I think that's a fitting... Um, New title for him based on the ending of the episode. But before moving forward into the actual review, please take a moment to hit the thumbs up button to show you like the video. Hit subscribe. We are less than 100 people away from 275,000 subscribers. And then we're going to move forward to 300,000. I know we can do it. So please hit subscribe. A bulk of my views come from people who have not subscribed. So please take that one second to hit the button and hit the bell icon to select all. That way you are informed whenever I post new content on the channel. We just started this new uh, season of Sisters and the Oval Season 5 is continuing now. So please don't miss out on the content. Make sure you are up to date. So let's talk about two extreme elephants in the room. One, Jordan was recast. I believe it was stated that the actor from Season 6 was unavailable because he was filming NCIS Sydney, which I believe takes place in Australia. So he was not available to film this particular season of the show. And no, this took place prior to any sort of writers or actor strike that had nothing to do with the character changes and the new writers. This was done before all of that happened. So no, the strike has nothing to do with how season seven is going to play out. Um, the new actor, 
I think he did okay. I, I get it. Some people, oh, you know, the chemistry is off between him and the other cast. And, oh, you know, I, I know. First of all, I'm not a huge fan of cast, you know, um, recasting. We had to deal with this already with Jake, where instead of recasting the character or the actor, because the actor was, again, un unavailable, they just wrote in Bryce, who was a completely new character who filled in the blanks where Jake left off. In the case of Jordan, they just decided to recast. Now, to me, the most distracting thing is he looks eerily similar to Rico from season one. Rico, if you don't remember, he's the name that keeps popping up. Everybody, oh, that's that's Karen's baby daddy. That's the one who Karen's pregnant by. That was it. That was her old reliable. Whenever Zach wasn't acting right, um, you know, early on in the series. So that's the thing that threw me off. But I think he did okay. I think it's going to take some time getting used to, um, you know, this new actor because, well, yeah, it is odd because we have a new actor. But remember, Jordan from season six, he wasn't in that many episodes. He was in like one, two, three, four, maybe half a dozen or less but at the same time maybe if there was a hiatus it wouldn't have hit so hard but to go from one week to another it's like wait who, who are you but um that's what it is that's the shift in the actor secondly the episode starts off with danny's abduction or attack being a nightmare i thought the new writers did a brilliant job that was the best way to go from the head scratching cliffhanger because what did I tell you last week how in the world is she going to get attacked and abducted and we have a three-month time skip we know Danny's okay based on the trailer are they just going to brush past that like it didn't happen they wrote it as a dream or a nightmare and I thought that was the best way to do it I know a lot of people are like man this is the same crap they did with Karen shooting Fatima a mid-season end with uh, Fatima getting shot and then the episode opens and it's a dream. Eh? I don't blame the new writers. Tyler was the one who ended season six the way that he did. Not the new writers. So the writers had to say, how are we going to fix this? What are we supposed to do? Nightmare. And it's funny because that's what a lot of people say. That's what the haves and the have-nots needs to do. Have a character wake up from a nightmare and realize the series finale and stuff that happened before was just some elaborate dream. Catherine, during her breast cancer surgery in season one, just saying. But the tra uh, the recap made it seem like it was Jonah who was attacking her. And I'm like, but we get a clear look at this guy and it's not him. But it makes sense if you know that were the case, but no. Now, getting into the actual review. Sorry about this, but you know I had to really hit home those... Uh, plot points this episode did jump around a lot if you are someone who watched ambitions on own i believe jamie giddens also wrote this episode because it had the same flow we never stayed in the same scene too long we jumped around a lot like a soap opera so my notes are kind of all over the place i'm going to do my best to review all the different character scenes together because if I jump around, this review is going to be a long one. So the episode starts with the nightmare. And then we see Tony and Danny in bed together. And I'm thinking, how dare you lay where Preston laid? And El Fuego. And Jonah. And the bartender from the gay bar. Yeah, there were a lot of guys in that bed with Danny. But I hate to say it. But this episode almost made me start to like Tony. I'm like, ah, don't do it. But he suggests therapy because Danny, over the past three months, has been having all these bad dreams. And it's funny to me because the moment Danny goes into her, you know, jokey joke uh, mode, Tony quickly called her out. No, no, no. You're being deflecting Danny right now. And we don't need that. And I'm trying to give you some advice because I take therapy, too. And it's funny because Danny scoffed at the idea. It's like, oh, so what, you have different personalities and why didn't you tell me you were going to therapy and whatnot? And the only person in my family that's ever done it was Uncle Junebug who came back from war thinking that he was his own robot clone or something. So basically, um, 
Tony just says that, look, you might be repressing some stuff and these dreams can mean something. So I think it might be a good idea for you to talk with somebody who's a professional. And it's interesting because um, Tony started therapy after his divorce. And Danny did say that she would eventually think about going. Now, one thing um, to mention here is people think that, you know what? Over the past three months, it's funny because Danny never had those dreams with Preston around. And one of the last things Preston said before leaving was that he hopes, you know, you can find somebody that can protect you in case that dude ever shows up again. Because you know what? I'm just done because he realized that maybe one of the only one of the only reasons that Danny even kept him around was to protect him in case that uh, guy ever showed up again. So, yeah, I think Danny might be holding on to that. Maybe she doesn't feel safe with Tony. That could be it. Just saying. But um, we go over to Andy's penthouse. First of all, KJ rocking the long hair. Love the look. The most shocking thing to me. A lot of people are like, J wait, who's this guy? Because Jordan has a new actor. And I already knew this. And then Penelope and Gary showed up. But the thing about this scene that threw me off the most, Andy was cooking. I know, I know that sounds like really, really random, but I do not believe that in the course of this series, we've ever seen Andy in a kitchen cooking. So that threw me off for a loop. So two questions is like, one, Penelope's still pregnant. It should be way past her time to have the baby because it's been beyond nine months and i think she's in month 10 or something and look i was made aware that some of the writers did a twitter spaces talking with fans last night i have not listened to it yet my attention was focused on the uh what was it the cat williams interview with shannon sharp that's been my like secondary priority aside from the uh season premiere i will watch that or listen to that twitter space and i'll get back to you after i've uh, listened to it later this week i might listen to it later today when i'm editing videos but i'll do a video with my thoughts on it within the next day or so so be on the lookout for that so yeah penelope shows up with gary and it's like wait a minute what are they doing there like you know penelope is back with gary which i did a video on and posted yesterday before the episode but um, we get a lot. Okay, one of the things I didn't like about the scene jumping, I'm like, okay, let's uh get to the bottom of this mystery. Like, why are they there? So Andy is listing off all the things she cooked, and Gary was just, ugh. and I mentioned this during the live. If you remember Medea Family Funeral, that KJ Smith was actually in that movie. Her husband in the film. He could not, he could not hide his anger. His default face was pissed off. That was Gary this entire episode. Everybody's being cordial. Jordan's happy to see his sister again. Andy and Penelope are cool. Gary's the only one giving off a haughty attitude about everything. Just a elitist, I'm above all of this. And he can't believe Andy is being nice without any sort of, animosity basically accusing her of being fake but in reality he's the only one that has a chip on his shoulder so they go from standing around in the kitchen to just sitting on the couch and for one jordan wanted to see his sister because it's been a while since they've you know interacted and then from there, you have Andy, who mentions, I look, I also wanted to get rid of any lingering tension that may be occurring between us. So it's all water under the bridge on my end, but Gary doesn't buy it. And he even goes so far as to take his arm from around Penelope, kind of pushing her forward. And it's like, bro, she's carrying precious cargo. You don't care. But the most ominous thing he said was, you know what, I think we're going to go. I mean, we don't want anything to happen to your sister or your future niece or nephew, right, Jordan? And I'm like, wait a minute. Nobody catches, nobody else caught that? I mean, he's literally delivering a line in that venomous Gary fashion. And it's like, 
nobody wants to address that. Jordan, that, that's your sister. You don't care? Okay. So, also, I have to mention, it's funny how the recast is, like, taller than the original Jordan. Because remember, <laughs> when Jordan found out about Gary cheating on his sister, and he wanted to charge at him in a fight, and he's clearly shorter than Gary... But this new guy, I believe, is around the same height, if not a little taller. And I'm like, if they throw hands, I don't think that Gary's going to have an easy go of it. So you better watch your mouth. But essentially, he thinks this is all an act. And he's mad because Gary, I mean, Andy tried to ruin his life by exposing him. But in reality, eh, kind of had it coming. So it's all a sick game to Gary and he's mad looking over at Andy, how she's talking about how, you know, I found a partner who, you know, um, treats me right and whatnot. Kind of like, and Gary's like, wait, wait, wait. He's like, well, you know, I'm telling the truth about not using me and things like that. So Andy's glowing. I mean, G Gary has that. How come her hair weren't, how come her hair wasn't like that when we were together? Huh? Huh? And now it's revealed that, Jordan's going for city council and Gary has that look on his face. Like I got some for your ass. And he sends him a hundred thousand dollars for his campaign. He's hesitant to take it. Andy is iffy about it, but Penelope's like, Hey Andy, but you said it's all water, water under the bridge, right? So why don't you just let my brother take this money and everything will be cool. We're, it'll be a fresh start. And it's like Penelope, what's going on? Shouldn't you know by now that anytime Gary does something like this, there's some sort of hidden agenda or motive, whatever. So then Gary just gets up and goes to the bathroom because he's acting all nice all of a sudden. And then, you know, Jordan at his expense, Penelope's telling Andy a bunch of embarrassing stories from when they were kids. And they notice how long it's taking for, uh, Gary in the restroom so Penelope goes up to find him and then this man he was digging through Andy's drawers at first I'm like what did he hide something there you know like a recording device or something I mean this is Gary so that's probably something he did when he bought the penthouse or maybe one of the last times he was over there but he goes in and pulls out something black I'm like oh maybe he has something wrapped up in like a cloth or something and I'm like wait a minute so then when Penelope catches him, we clearly see this dude is pulling a Tommy, got the drawers, sniffing on Andy's panties and, you know, pleasuring himself. And then Penelope rolls in and didn't have the decency to let him finish. What the? <laughs> and then the episode ended on that. But um, that's pretty much everything involving the Andy stuff and Gary. So we check in on some of the other characters. Simply put, Zach and Fatima, it's the sneak peek scene. It turns out Michael is in foster care. Uh, Miss B, I don't know if that's the name of the foster parent or like the department person who is kind of like the liaison between Zach and Michael's new family. But I did like the fact it's like, hey, we'll tell Michael his daddy loves him. And Fatima too. And Fatima too. I, I, I like that little detail. I like that. But basically, you know... Heather called the cops after they took Michael. Michael was put into foster care. And for the past three months, Zach has still been dealing with the turmoil of not being able to have his son with him. And, you know, just like season six, it's Fatima offering a bunch of reassurance that, look, we did everything we could. Zach just feels like he should be doing something more. And it turns out Andy is his attorney on this case. How is Andy involved with this stuff with the child support? I mean, the custody. I thought she was a divorce lawyer. It all falls under the same umbrella as family law, which Andy is equipped to handle. That's why. So, um, Zach gives Andy a call, basically just grasping at straws. What if I hired like a PI or something to see if Heather isn't, you know, creating a safe living environment for our son. And Andy's like, look, don't do that because if her legal team finds out, that's going to feel like you're harassing her and it's not going to be a good look for you. So basically don't do that. 
So from there, Zach and the team up decide to have a little fun upstairs for the night. And that's pretty much their thing for the episode. Okay. Um, last two to talk about Sabrina and Karen. So let's talk Sabrina first, and then we'll finish up with Karen at the salon. All right. So Sabrina is in her office and she's setting things up. She has a picture of her girls. This is actually a real picture from the uh, gospel brunch at Tyler Perry Studios from way back in 2019. So that was a pretty good little Easter egg there. So it seems that speaking with corporate, Sabrina was able to get her old job back at her bank as opposed to going to the uh, downtown division. And I mentioned this in the short I did about Rich. I'm like, oh, so Rich and Sabrina are still going strong. But I'm like, the bank seems very similar to the original bank set. So I don't know, maybe the banks look alike. But no, this is her old job. Now, Rich does say, look, you need to stop overworking yourself. I figured you would be working late, but I know you're trying to just prove yourself to those people who did you wrong by, you know, accusing you of being involved with that robbery and you ought to sue them. And I've been saying this like, you know, Sabrina's biggest piece of evidence was if I was part of the bank robbery, why would I foil the robbery by informing the other bank that we were being robbed based on a key word? So I don't really know why Sabrina got in trouble. But basically, um, you know, Rich comes in and they've been dating for the past three months. And Sabrina seems very loose and whatnot compared to her previous persona. I mean, Rich was down to having sex right there on her desk, but... She, you know, she was into it at first, been like, oh, wait, you know, I can't, hey, I just got my job back. And how about this? The back of my car, huh? Let's do it. So <laughs> they were literally about to uh, go, but then Sabrina gets a phone call because Tony actually um, got out of bed from Danny's and went to the bathroom and made a phone call. At first, I'm like, hmm, who is he calling? Now, we do see him getting dressed later. And telling Danny he needs to go run in there. And I'm like, oh, maybe it was a phone call from his kids or his ex-wife. And he's going to go check on them. But no, Sabrina pops in. And basically, Tony was concerned and was calling Sabrina about Danny's nightmares and therapy. So it looks like they're going to talk about that in the next episode. Um, But before all that happened, Maurice and Sabrina are on the phone basically talking about the situation where, you know, she got her job back. Which... I mean, did she just get it back? It's been three months. I mean, how long before she got hired back? I, I don't know. Maybe it was. Maybe it took a little while because if she started at the downtown branch, like her uh, um, Miss India or whatever said, she could have started like immediately. But considering she wanted her old job back, maybe there was some discussion. So I am not fully aware if she is still the manager of this bank. Or if she is still at her old bank, but is a system manager now. I don't know. But uh, Maurice is still doing his online thing. But the main takeaway of this scene is Calvin. And the fact that I was right, he would be written off of a line of dialogue explaining that he moved out of the apartment for whatever reason. Calvin is gone. He moved out, I believe, out of Atlanta with a white girl. And if I'm not mistaken... It could be Peggy. Now, I could be wrong about this, but it might be Peggy. That makes the most sense because that's the only, you know, female outside of Sabrina. I believe we've seen him interact with aside from that one chick he was on a date with. But I can't remember if that was Peggy or not. But regardless, um, Sabrina's shocked. And it's like, well, I can't believe I know things didn't work out between us. But I, I, I thought that, you know, relationship wise, but I thought he would at least say goodbye. And it's like, look, don't let this go to your big head. But he said he didn't want to see you to say goodbye because if he did, he wouldn't have left. And then, and then he all kind of like Tony calling out Danny for deflecting Maurice rightfully pointed out, girl, you have no right to be upset about what Calvin does or doesn't do regarding telling you goodbye because it doesn't matter. You say you didn't want him. Plus you've been with this new guy for months. So, and that's the thing that threw me for a loop. Sabrina has the nerve to be in her feelings, yet she's been dating Rich for the past three freaking months. Like, what does she, what does she expect Calvin owed her? It's ridiculous. But um, aside from that, hmm, 
Yeah, the Karen stuff is the last stuff to talk about. So, um, if I'm not mistaken, Pam called it Karen's Fresh Start Salon. And that's the name of the new salon. Pam is an influencer now. She's online doing lives in order to, you know, build hype for the upcoming opening of the salon. And I'm going to touch on this once and I will not talk about it again, at least in this video. Karen has a noticeable baby bump, but it does look rather strange. I mean, in three months time, she's as big as Penelope, it seems. Oh, the baby bump is too low. Why is the baby bump at her thighs and all? I'm not saying a dang thing. Kind of like the new writers. Oh, Tyler needs new writers. How many people clamored for new writers and we finally got new writers and people said they didn't like the show? People were clamoring about a baby bump. Karen finally got a baby bump and people are complaining about that. Does it look ridiculous? Yes, it does. But I'm not complaining about it because I wasn't one of the people who demanded a baby bump. You know, if you've been on this channel long enough, I've said it at least 50 times. I do not care about whether or not Karen has a baby bump. So now that it's here, people will complain about anything. People talk about me. Oh, Jeremy, you nitpick and whatnot. But at least I don't complain. If I do have a gripe about something, I'll let you know why I have a gripe about it. I'm not going to be hypocritical like, Oh, we need to do something to increase the quality. And then when it does increase, oh, it sucks. No. So g give it a rest. The baby bump is here to stay. Now, two things with this. It turns out Brian left his job as Karen's contractor. Now, apparently, he left because of personal, personal marital issues. Pam is like, I bet you had something to do with that. What are you talking about? Because I'm thinking that Chelsea girl, the realtor and whatnot, she started gossiping about the fact that, you know, this uh, girl, Karen, who's working with Brian now, thinking about buying one of his buildings. You know, Brian actually let her ride in his car. Wait, what? Because remember, she has a bunch of girls that, you know, um, were trying to throw themselves at Brian, but he was incredibly loyal. And notice how, despite being loyal to his wife for who knows how long despite the number of women throwing themselves at him karen nothing really happened until karen now we don't know what's going on because we jumped three months ahead i wouldn't be shocked if they did have a little something going on maybe not i don't know maybe maybe it was sexual i don't know or maybe the fact that, you know, she doesn't want to be bothered with Aaron and Zach is doing his thing with Fatima. Karen just liked the attention. And maybe Brian was doing one too many things extra with Karen that he wasn't doing with any other client. Coming home late. Maybe they went out to lunch or something. His wife didn't like it. And that's why he, I bet his wife was the reason. Kind of like um how Tamara was the reason that Hayden dropped heather as a client at the law firm i feel the same thing about brian and karen like his wife was like nah -uh, and then left karen high and dry so they got a new contractor that's my thoughts on that and sadly it seems that karen is back to her old bitter petty ways because she does take some jabs at zach and fatima also pam stop it it's been three freaking months stop trying to take digs at um you know zach for not showing up it's like look get aaron to call you get one of your men to call you it's like call aaron he'll come out in a heartbeat and help you clean this place up aaron is a good man but he's not the man so no what about zach and then she just started taking digs at him and fatima even goes so far as to talk about fatima's edges and whatnot i'm like wow okay really so unfortunately the karen of old seems to have reared her ugly head again i mean it makes me miss the season 6b where she was nice and smiling i'm guessing that maybe the brian thing is the reason for this that she was loving the stuff that was going on with brian between her and him but then the moment that got cut off she started feeling lonely again and just taking jabs at you know low-hanging fruit but essentially you know they're trying to clean up and get ready for the salon opening soon and um pam is like look girl it's time for me to go I want to go out to a party. You need to come out with me. Karen's like, ain't nobody checking for a pregnant woman like me. And um, it's funny because Pam then says, look, I'm about to get this place popping. We about to be rich. And I'm like, what are you, 
what are you going to do a strip club but then somebody on the live was like maybe she's thinking about turning the salon into like a nightclub or something that is definitely up pam's alley it's like when the salon closes nightclub boom i i definitely feel that as something she would do but with that being said um i believe that's it i think that covers the entire episode from start to finish um, the new, the ladies have new look. Also, Sabrina was rocking that purple. She was probably my favorite dressed sister of the episode. Honestly, Pam was looking cute in like the denim outfit too. But I think Sabrina's purple suit, I, li I like that. When Sabrina rocks the right colors, oh, Novi Brown can rock those colors. Andy's hair. I just love seeing Fatima with the Zatima do. Also, Zach rocking, you know, the gold chain, the black shirt look from Zatima. Um, yeah, good stuff. So, uh, let, let's talk about the episode in the comment section below. Like and subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next video.